Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to the TOP slash Save the Children hosted event. Uh, top, I'm Adam Keen. I'm the Deputy Director of the TOP program. Our Director, Mark Fritzler, just landed from Johannesburg, so we didn't force him to come through directly from the airport to welcome you all to this event. And welcome to everybody online as well. Happy to have you with us. Uh, I guess the cold weather and the blowing snow may have kept numbers down a little bit this afternoon, um, but we're glad to see a good number of people online for this presentation. Before I introduce Kyle uh, Murphy, who's going to do the presentation, I just thought, uh, Adam, that you might want, or, or Arif, I'm not sure which of you was going to say a word about the relationship between Food for Peace and uh, Jay Powell. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adam, good afternoon. Uh, I just like to say a few words from from Food for Peace. We have been in discussion with uh, JPAL, uh, Poverty Action Lab, for quite some time, maybe eight nine months, uh, and uh, to explore the possibility because they do randomized control trial, right? That's kind of their bread and butter. And uh, so we have been struggling as an agency to improve our theory of change based on evidence. So we thought that this could be a great marriage, that they, they are the repository of evidences, uh, particularly in the field of agriculture. And we can, both Food for Peace and its implementing partners can benefit from the evidences that we can glean from uh, JPAL. So we have been discussing for a while, and then we, we are happy that uh, finally we, were, we, we, we found ways where we can collaborate with each other. Uh, we, they are helping us to even contribute to helping our partners you know, to identifying evidence that can be used to improve uh, theory of change, improve project design, uh, they will be, and then, you know, they are partnering with TOPS to provide capacity building uh, training and webinar. So we are all looking forward to it. You know that we are, we are piloting Refine and Implement in DRC and in Liberia, and uh, JPAL or uh, ATRAI, uh, and Kyle, you know, I have a hard time to explain, <laughs> so Kyle will give you the, you know, the difference. But, uh, uh, they will be joining us in DRC uh, to help the partners to, to look for opportunities where there is an existing evidence that can be linked, as well as they, one of the activities that they do is they do matchmaking. So for example, JPAL has a pool of researchers who, uh, and then they will be looking for ways that the, based on the interest from our partner, as well as interest from their researcher, whether they would like to set up uh, impact evaluation. For free, so that's the uh, icing of the cake. Mm -hmm. And not for free, free to us. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Somebody will pay. Yeah. Somebody will pay. Yeah. Right. So, thank you, Arif. Um, so, Kyle Murphy is here to do this presentation. Kyle is um, is the policy manager at MIT's Jamil uh, Latif Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Uh, and the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative. There are a lot of long acronyms in here, <laughs> uh, which is also supported by uh, University of California Berkeley Center for Effective Global Action. So uh, Kyle has been with um, JPAL since 2015. Prior to that, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua, where he worked in the agricultural sector, so has a lot of experience in the field. and. Um, uh, in this technical area of uh, randomized control trials. So we're, we hope this will be a series of presentations. This is the first. Um, and so we appreciate you all being here with us in the room, on the phone, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Kyle Murphy, I'm the policy manager at JPAL. I'll try to explain a bit about all of the acronyms uh, in terms of this series of presentations. This one is a bit of motivation behind uh, at JPAL, how we think about randomized evaluations and uh, where they fit into broader 
the broader world of impact evaluation and what we can learn from them, and then potentially the future uh, uh, series would be about what we think we've learned from the body of evaluations we've already done in agriculture. Uh, so to give a bit of, so if I can get, there we go. Uh, I'm going to start with some background on J-PAL and ATI, uh, as well as uh, impact evaluation. Uh, talk about what, random, what randomized evaluations are, why we think they're powerful, um, and talk about some real-world constraints uh, that you face in the field doing these, and then some conclusions about where randomized evaluations can fit inside of a, a broader uh, monitoring evaluation framework. So JPAL is the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. We're uh, housed in the Economics Department at MIT in Boston, uh, in Cambridge. So um, we try to ensure that policy is informed by evidence and that the research we do is translated into action. We do this through three uh, large verticals, the first being evaluations, um, where we specialize in randomized evaluations. Uh, randomized impact evaluations of development interventions in the field. We do policy outreach, which is the uh, team I'm on. So we both do the matchmaking end of trying to get new evaluations started and then take the results uh, and get them into the hands of people who can use them. And then we also have a capacity building team which runs trainings for um, M&E professionals on uh, implementing these evaluations. So at our core, we are a network of 140 uh, affiliate professors uh, who are mostly economists, there are some political scientists as well, but they're united by their expertise in using randomized evaluation uh, as a methodology. And they come from a wide variety of universities across the world. Uh, and to date we have almost 800 ongoing and completed uh, projects across eight sectors uh, in 69 countries. And these are, you can see the uh, dots are by are colored by uh, sector. Uh, so we work in agriculture, uh, which is the, the group that I manage, and then crime, education, environment and energy, finance and microfinance, health, labor markets, and political economy and governance. Uh, here's the map of the agriculture program, uh, agriculture evaluations, most of which you'll see are concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, a big reason of that is from, this is a little out of date, but we also run the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative, which uh, we co-manage with SEGA at UC Berkeley. So this is a fund that's uh, uh, financed by the Gates Foundation and DFID uh, that allows us to grant out money to do new evaluations uh, with a focus in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and to date, uh, We've surveyed over 100,000 farmers, uh, a little under half of which were female farmers, and have surveyed uh, around 18,000 farmers whose behavior has changed as a result of the interventions that we've evaluated. So that's a quick background on JPAL and ATI. Now I want to uh, switch to talking a bit about um, why we think randomized evaluations are powerful and what we think we can learn from them. And uh, I'll start with some background on what we think about impact, it might be a little basic, but I think it's necessary to, to, to frame the question of why or when we might want to use randomized evaluation. So evaluation can mean a lot of things. Um, you can think about uh, uh, descriptive statistics on the ground, if we're thinking about farmers with plot size, uh, average incomes, crop mix, things like that. Within that, we have the world of program evaluation, which also includes uh, process questions of our services being delivered on the ground, like we think they're supposed to be, and also impact evaluation. So is this program moving the outcomes we care about? Within impact evaluation, then, one particular methodology uh, is a randomized control trial. So um, for example, we, we might think about uh, impact, and we might have a program here that provides uh, information to farmers by cell phones. And if we look, we have, we'll have say the primary outcome here on the y-axis is uh, yield, and we're looking over time. So we might see after the program starts that there's a big increase in yield. So simply from this graph, we can see there's a big increase of yield, and we might be tempted to say that this is uh, this program 
it's been effective. However, what's important to consider is what would have happened in the absence of the program, so the counterfactual. So if, so in this case, the impact is not the difference between the yellow dot at the end line and the yellow dot when the program started, but rather the difference between the counterfactual, so what would have happened in the absence of the program, and what happened with the program. So we can see this had a positive impact here. So the key to knowing what has happened is to be able to say what would have happened in the absence of the program. So the counterfactual, which I mentioned before and I'll talk about a little more later. And to give another couple scenarios to drive this point home. So here we have our same farmers, they're getting their information, yields increase, but it might be the case then that in the world without this program, yields would have increased anyway. So there might be a lot of different things influencing things here. It might be that everyone had a good year, weather was good, or there might be another program going on at the same time and we're picking up that effect. So we need to consider what would have happened. In this case, we might be tempted to say that it was a positive impact without considering the counterfactual, but it was actually negative. What's even worse could be a situation like this, where we see after the program starts, yields are falling and we could think this doesn't work. However, it could be that in the absence of the program, yields would have fallen even more and we would have concluded that the program didn't work when actually we're missing these very important social safety net benefits of the program. So... How often do you, the slide before, find that the intervention of the program prevented or restrained the population from advancing like the counterfactual did? Do you understand what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. I don't think I have an answer for that. So these are just kind of trying to demonstrate that it's important to think of the counterfactual. These aren't necessarily real world examples. That's definitely the case sometimes, but I don't think I can take quite how common that is. Okay. Can you give an example of when that, in your experience, when that's been the case? I'm just surprised by that because you always, I just kind of always think an intervention would be positive in terms of agriculture, I guess, maybe just in general. Let me think. Not to put you on the spot, but maybe later if it comes, maybe you can come back to me. I'll think about that. Yeah, so I think it would be the case of considering unintended consequences, but really what I just, these are all hypothetical at this point. I just want to hammer home that we need to critically consider what would have happened in the absence of the program. So I'll think about that a bit. So the counterfactual then is the state of the world that would have happened in the absence of the program. But even though it's a very abstract concept, it is the fundamental thing to expressing impact a program has. However, it cannot be directly observed. So we can't just watch this group of farmers, give them the intervention, and then go back in time and watch them again. So the key function of any impact evaluation is mimicking this counterfactual, so finding a stand-in group for what would have happened. Usually this is done by selecting a group of individuals that didn't participate in the program, and we would call these the comparison or the control group. And I'll in a bit look at kind of the world of different impact evaluation methodologies. The critical difference between them is the way that this counterfactual group is constructed. So the idea is to select a group that's exactly like the group that's going to get the intervention, but the only difference between them is that their exposure to the program. So in the case of our farmers getting this cell phone information, we want to have a group that has the same plot size, same gender dynamics in the household, have the same climate on their farm, all of these different factors, and compare them to the group that does get the intervention. So the goal here is that if they're similar at the beginning, we can attribute any differences as we track them over time to what's happened from the program and not to these other confounding factors. However, 
in reality, it's generally the case that individuals that participate in a program, those who do not are fundamentally different on, on a lot of measures. So it could be that programs are placed in a specific area because it's an area of need, a poorer or richer area, and that individuals from one area are, are uh, uh, systematically different from the other. Um, individuals might be screened for participation in the program, um, and the decision to participate might be voluntary. So we might think that highly motivated people are opting into a program, and, those, and they're different than those who aren't motivated to do so. So just comparing the outcomes of one group to the other um, is not going to give you the impact of the program. What it will give you is uh, the pre-existing differences, the selection bias, plus the impact of the program. And since we don't have a reliable way of measuring these pre-existing differences, usually, um, we, we can't decompose the, uh, the impact estimate between the selection effect and the program effect. Uh, so one key, uh, one key advantage of randomized evaluation is because we control this mechanism by which people are selected in and out of a, a program, that selection bias disappears and we're getting just the, the impact of the program. So I put this up as just uh, uh, there are many different ways to construct the counterfactual and these are kind of the world of evaluation methods and the main way in which they differ is how they, they do that. So the two main groups are randomized experiments, which we'll be talking about today, and then uh, non or quasi-experimental methods. So pre-post, where you're just looking at before the program and after the program of just the people who got it, um, uh, up to things like regression discontinuity, where you're looking at an event and using uh, statistical methods to parse out the uh, causal impact of the program. I'm not going to put go into too much depth on these. Uh, today, because they're not our focus, I just put it up as a demonstration of this is kind of the world of options. Uh, so what is a randomized evaluation? Uh, you would start a randomized evaluation, the form of impact evaluation that constructs a counterfactual group through random assignment. So this can be at the village or household or individual level. This is just a, a, an illustrative uh, uh, example. But say we start with a group uh, of eligible individuals or health, the population is then randomly split into two or more groups. And because um, they're randomly selected, they're statistically identical before the program. So on average, they have the same number of household members, they have the same number of people born on Tuesdays, so on observable, unobservable characteristics, they're statistically even. We then follow them, we give the intervention to one group and not to the other, we follow them over the course of the program, uh, and then measure outcomes again, and any differences we can then attribute directly to the program, uh, because there are no statistical differences between the groups at the onset. Um, so the key steps in doing this, uh, first is to design, the, and this will come back when I'm talking about the, the challenges of it, but it takes a lot of pre-work. So you have to design the study carefully before evaluating. Since this happens in real time, you have to measure things. You have to know what you're going to measure and measure it at the baseline to get at the results later. Um, so you collect this baseline data and then you randomly assign people to treatment and control. You can verify that the assignment is random. So as I mentioned before, usually we don't have a mechanism to be able to look at selection bias. Here we do. Um, so here's an example of how you might verify that. Um, so you look at the treatment and control group, at, so you collect baseline data and then randomize and you can look by treatment and control group and look at the difference and there's no statistical, statistically significant differences between any of these groups and we can look at this ahead of time and know that at the onset these groups are equal, um, ensuring or making us more confident in asserting that what we're measuring later is actually the impact of the program. So then we'd want to monitor this uh, throughout the process, collect follow-up data, and then analyze it for impact. So what are the advantages of this? So as I mentioned before, in all other impact evaluation methods, we need to assume that the groups do not uh, differ systematically at the outset. 
Um, in this case, we can be much more confident in that assumption because we can actually look at the numbers and test it. So then any differences that arise between treatment and, and comparison groups can be attributed directly to the program. Another advantage that I think gets glossed over a lot is that there are fewer assumptions required overall. So if we go back to this list here on the non or quasi experimental, these are kind of uh, organized by, by most to fewest uh, uh, assumptions you need to make for causal inference. But they all are very nuanced and it, it can tend to be hard to, to communicate those results, whereas there's a, a much uh, shorter list of assumptions you need to make for a randomized evaluation. So when, once you have the results, it, it can be easier to communicate them to a less technical audience, which I think is a, a real key advantage. So what can we learn? I want to walk through an example um, of a single evaluation. So this is with Nerica Rice in Sierra Leone. Um, so uh, low rice production is a threat to food security across a lot of Africa, uh, in particular in Sierra Leone. Uh, they used to be a net exporter of rice before the Civil War. Now they uh, import a lot at a very high cost. One promising intervention for this are improved seed varieties like Nerica, which is the new rice for Africa, which combine uh, the characteristics of Asian rices uh, being high yielding and the disease and drought resistance of African rices. Another key advantage is that they're shorter planting uh, duration so they can bring in the harvest during the hungry season and um, have potential, potentially large uh, food security benefits. The drawback there is that it has to be harvested in the rainy season, so there are um, cultivation techniques that are particular to these varieties. So, Despite the high potential for impact, the adoption of these high-yielding high varieties has been very low, and we might think that one of the barriers are uh, high costs to being an early adopter. So there's risk associated with, not, with uh, additional labor, unsure of, uh, farmers might be unsure of the results, not having seen these uh, varieties in action before. And a potential solution is you might offer subsidies um, and trainings to increase take up and boost early adoption at spillover effects to affect the rest of the farmers in the village. So uh, an implementer might be asking in this case, what level of subsidies are most effective or um, is the training effective at all? Is it worth spending all this money on the training? So uh, researchers partnered uh, on an evaluation of 120 communities which were randomly assigned to three different pricing groups to get at this question of whether subsidies are effective and which level uh, uh, was which level worked. So um, within these communities, five farmers each in each community were randomly selected to either uh, get free rice, a 50% subsidy, or full price. So full price in this case is the stand-in for the counterfactual. This is what would have happened in the absence of the program. Um, so additionally, then each of these three treatment groups were cross-cut and half were, uh, in half of the communities they were offered specific training about this drying the rice during the, the wet season and uh, the additional labor inputs, things like that. Um, and this design then allows, excuse me, for the inference of both what is the impact of this entire program as well as disentangling the uh, result of is it the subsidy driving impact, is it the training, is it the combination. Uh, and I want to now highlight this, this top group uh, with the free rates to look at the results of the training. So I, I think this is a case, I, I, I like to talk about this because I think it's um, a bit of a surprising result and it's something that we might have missed without critically considering the counterfactual and putting so much free work into thinking about what questions we want to ask from the onset of the program. So yields in this case increased, but they only increased when farmers were offered the training. So yield, it was a 16% increase for trained farmers and no increases without training. Actually the point estimate was negative. Uh, it wasn't statistically significant, but the point estimate was negative for farmers who didn't receive the training. So in this case, the randomized design disentangled, because it disentangled these components, it revealed the cost to ignoring extension. So we might have, 
without doing all this pre-work, we might have been tempted to say, like, oh, this this works, but the trainings are kind of expensive, so it might have less of an effect if we just do the subsidy. Let's roll it out. But in this case, that actually would have hurt farmers most likely. So the, this is a really powerful piece of evidence to, uh, to for the partner to then go uh, uh, all in on the training. Uh, unfortunately, in the follow-up, this was interrupted by the Ebola outbreak, and, and we're still waiting for the uh, to follow on, on this, but uh, I think this is a, a really nice demonstration of how powerful this methodology can be. Uh, so now I want to talk about, uh, since the logistical question on the ground of the Ebola outbreak really uh, uh, caused a problem for the follow-up on this, I want to start talking about some of the benefits and the drawbacks, challenges in the field of doing this kind of work. So first, for the benefits, one of the most powerful things here is tailoring the evaluation to the questions. So these can answer specific questions very well and give you uh, uh, very rigorous, clearly explainable results about the, the most important questions you have. Um, we designed the, the evaluation to answer specifically the questions. We have, unfortunately, the drawback there is that we can't use it to infer things that we haven't thought to ask. So it takes a lot of work ahead of time uh, to really think critically about what you want to answer. Um, another advantage is that these are prospective. So um, beyond putting all this pre-work in, another benefit is it tends to foster really close relationships between uh, implementing organizations and researchers, which can uh, lead to really high value partnerships in the long term. Uh, and another, as I said several times, there are more clear findings. Um, so when are these most appropriate? So given the cost to, to undertake these, and so they're very expensive, they often uh, they take a lot of time and money for this pre-work, uh, always or almost always uh, require specific data collection, all which is very costly. So uh, it's important to carefully consider when this is going to be most useful. So first, uh, definitely when there's an important question you need to answer. So this might be something where it's a common program and there's little evidence informing whether it works or not. Um, some uncertainty about which alternative strategy to use. So in that previous example, if uh, you're giving a 50% subsidy or if you're going to, uh, going to give a training or not, um, or some key question that underlies a lot of different programs. In terms of timing, uh, it's important for it not to be too early or too late. If it's too early and there's still a lot of logistical kinks to roll out, a uh, process evaluation is really what you should be doing, not investing in. So if, you're, uh, if there are big kinks in the delivery mechanism, you want to be measuring that on the ground rather than uh, doing all this work. Uh, but it could be too late. So if it's a program that's going to be shut down anyways or you're uh, rolling off of it, it doesn't make sense to put all this work in if it's not going to inform something that will scale or continue later. Um, also important that it's representative and not gold-plated. So if you're doing the Rolls-Royce version of a program, uh, you it, that it's unlikely to look anything like what would be scaled up in the, the field, that, that this, is, this kind of evaluation is not going to tell you very much. On the other hand, if it is like you, you're at the point where you've piloted a little bit, you know what it's going to look like, uh, and you're thinking about scaling, but you have these key questions, that's when to put this, this kind of effort in. Um, want to make sure you have the time, uh, the experience and money to do it right. A, uh, there are a lot of bad impact evaluations, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, yeah. So when not to do a randomized evaluation. So as I mentioned, when there's still considerable tinkering, ironing out the details. Um, Uh, or when it's too small to, scale, uh, to randomize into two representative groups, so sample size can be, be an issue. Um, and also, so if, posit if positive impact has been proven with one of these before, um, and there are significant resources to cover everyone, that's the time to 
scale. That's when we get into ethics questions, which I'm happy to talk about more later. But um, if we know it works and we can cover everyone, then tinkering about it more is probably, is probably an unethical situation to do this kind of, uh, this kind of evaluation. Uh, and as I mentioned, after the program's already begun and you're not expanding, this is probably not worth it. So, um, you talk about some common real world constraints. I'm not going to go into too much the solutions for these. Uh, I just want to flag them uh, as the common things we might face with these. So political advantages. So people, you might worry that uh, this might not seem fair. So you, or you're giving the treatment to one group. You're giving, not giving it to the other. Uh, there may be political blowback about this is something we think that works. Why are you giving it to everyone? Um, often, this is the most fair way to, to go about things. If there are limited resources, not every. It's usually the case that not everyone's going to get a program, anyways. Lotteries are transparent and uh, often the most fair way, if you have no other inclusion criteria, uh, to to distribute something. Another way you might think about this is if there is some kind of screening mechanism. Uh, there's going to be a range of people. So if uh, in education intervention, you have to have a certain test score to get into an after-school program, that there's going to be a range of people within that. You can randomize within that bubble and still create the kind of uh, experimental variation that we want to see to be uh, able to get a causal impact. Uh, in terms of resources, this is what I just mentioned. So. Um, Limited resources can be an evaluation opportunity. If they're excessive resources, then uh, you might think about testing different kinds of uh, versions of the program against each other. In terms of spillovers and uh, crossovers, sometimes this is what we're looking for. So spillovers and crossovers, this is if someone in the treatment group, uh, for example, with this NERICA right, so it was only given to five people in each community and trying to boost early adoption, the idea being that those early adopters would then tell their neighbors who would buy the new right seeds and reap all of the benefits um, of having those varieties. So in that case, it was specifically designed to look at spillover effects. So you're, you're also uh, interviewing other farmers in the community who didn't receive the program to test whether giving their neighbor something got it for them as well. So that's in one case. That's where we're actually looking for spillovers. In another uh, instance, it's something we might be worried about. So we might think about um, if we're giving these trainings to some farmers and then the, the control group, are their neighbors, are they talking to each other? Are, when we interview the neighbors, are they also already getting the information from these trainings? So that'd be a, a spillover. In that case, we want to think carefully about how we're selecting the level of randomization. Um, another being logistics. So, uh, for example, if we are doing something with nurses and they're out giving uh, deworming pills and we're trying to, to measure the effect of that, they might be worried that they have many overlapping responsibilities. They might be also just responsible for people in treatment and control. So these are, that's a challenge that we need to think about critically as we design and can present problems on the ground. Again, this is a matter of, I think, thinking about level of randomization. Um, have to think about fairness, too. So if we think about it, a classroom intervention um, where we're giving an after-school program. So if we're randomizing at the child level within classes, we have uh, half the class getting this, half of it's not. The parents are probably going to get mad if they perceive this as something that's adding value to the children. However, if we're doing it at the class level within schools, you think about the teachers are probably might get missed to the, their students are getting the extra attention. Um, so randomizing at the community level in this case might be most appropriate because the, then the treatment and control schools are less uh, likely to know about one another and uh, it might be easier to explain to the administrators. This is just something to keep in mind. Uh, sample size, I won't cover because I think that's fairly obvious. So I want to conclude before moving on to taking the question um, with just some thoughts about where uh, randomized evaluations can fit into the broader, uh, your broader evaluation framework. So 
these are very hard to do well, and this is something that people often talk about, about randomized evaluation. I want to stress that this is the case with all impact evaluations. Usually you have to collect new data. These things are expensive. There are a million things that can go wrong on the ground in terms of logistics. It takes a lot of monitoring. And it's also the case that badly done evaluations can be very misleading and damaging. So first, the study that claims to tell you the impact of a program but simply asks about impact without having a good strategy for thinking about the counterfactual, it might lead to the scale up of an ineffective program or the scaling down of something that is ineffective or the scaling down of something that is effective. And it can also generate noise that can drown out the rigorous evaluations of things that work. So good impact evaluations require good outcome measures and enough sample size, all of which is very expensive. But the implication is not that we need less or fewer good impact evaluations. Randomized evaluations and other evaluations can save much more money than they cost. So the implication is rather that we need to think carefully about when we're spending money on this and which impact evaluations to do. So don't do the bad ones. In some cases, the process of evaluation is going to be fine. Just don't try to read impact results from what's really a process evaluation. And complement good impact evaluations with other evaluation methods. So first, thinking about how to bring these into a broader strategy. So good descriptive work is important for diagnosing problems and selecting possible solutions. You can eliminate a lot of programs or options by just looking on the ground. So if we're thinking about a vaccine program, if we're looking and seeing if children get one vaccine but don't complete the course, it's probably not a cultural barrier to vaccination. So this is a place where people are happy to get their kids vaccinated, but it's a commitment problem. So by doing that descriptive work, you can limit the number of programs you're considering. Also, when I think about a business case assessment, so what would the impact need to be for this program to be cost effective? So you can think about even look at what the cost per participant is going to be. And with hopefully a literature review from the existing evidence, use these randomized evaluations to benchmark what you might expect the range of impacts to be. And see even under the best case scenario that you don't have a business case for it. So that's another way where these can be powerful tools after they're completed and help narrow down what you're actually spending on these more rigorous evaluations. And of course, literature reviews can tell you some things about what has been tested to work and these benchmarking of potential impacts. Process evaluation is always needed. I've talked about that a bit. And if a program is shown to be effective in many contexts, it's time to scale. So scaling always needs to be accompanied with a process evaluation just to see that the enabling factors for the impacts we see from these evaluations are met. But once we've established that something works, it's not always going to be the case that you need to keep doing this kind of randomized evaluation. And just finally, the big, the bold conclusion from all of this is randomized evaluations are most useful when we can, when we have important questions from the implementing side about what strategy to take and also where we're building broader knowledge in the academic community to have more theory-based ideas of categories of things that work and important questions to consider going forward. So that's it for the presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Kyle. Let me just start by seeing if there are any questions online here. And in the meantime, while we're looking, for those of you in the room, there is some delightful food on the back table. And you're welcome to help yourselves now and later. Any questions on? Yeah, I'll start with one from Jawad Nouri. He said, when you say design the study carefully, 
What are some of the factors that someone should consider in the design? So I think primary is just your research question. So uh, what parts of the program are the key questions uh, that you need answered for that will inform future implementation? So that that's primary. Um, other things would be the uh, what you expect the needed sample size will be. So you want to do some descriptive work on the ground to see what the variance on these outcomes you want to measure is. Uh, in the population, that will determine how much of a sample you need. You want to think about level of randomization. So uh, in the school example, you might think that if you're, say, you're giving textbooks to children, um, you're not going to want to do that at the individual level because if you give it at the individual level, two kids might be looking at the same book and you won't get the kind of variation you want. You'd want to do that at a classroom or or at school level, so you're thinking about level of randomization. Um, and uh, I guess coming back to the evaluation question, if you want to ask about different combinations of the program, um, you want to think about uh, how many different groups you need. Uh, another might be uh, timing. So it could be the case that you're phasing in a program over time and you do hope to reach everyone uh, eventually, so you could take advantage of that and do a phase in where uh, you, ran, you instead of randomly assigning who gets the program, you randomly assign who gets it first. Any questions here in the room? More on the, online? We do. So Diana had a question about the slide where you were determining if randomization was done properly. Mm -hmm. You focused on the significant difference between outcomes between the treatment and control group. And you were using that to ascertain that it was done properly. But just, she posits that just because there is no significant difference, it doesn't mean the outcomes are at the same levels. In other words, not rejecting a null hypothesis that the two groups are the same is not equivalent to accepting null hypothesis. For instance, it could be that your sample size is simply not large enough. Can you please elaborate? Yeah, I mean, I think that's correct. Um, I mean, it, that's absolutely correct. I don't, I, I don't know where to elaborate much other than, um, I mean, this, we would have determined the sample size here by uh, considering our baseline variance, um, but the, that, I mean, that's correct. This is the best we can do. No hands popping up here. Uh, I'll ask a question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is a practical question that I know the answer for, but I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> and uh, you and Arif can also uh, address on it. So we have all these lovely partners. Uh, hopefully some of them are online. Some of them are definitely in the room. Uh, what do you view your role, uh, and how would they access your abilities uh, going forward uh, with Food for Peace? So, um, like my my particular role, or the, or the role of the organization. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there are maybe few, your particular role. There are a few things uh, in as far as the policy group at JPAL goes. I think our role and where we can be helpful is if uh, we have a lot of resources in terms of synthesis from the the stable of randomized evaluations that we've done to date uh, in terms of big picture ideas about what we think uh, about interventions addressing uh, agricultural risk and information systems and uh, giving credit to smallholders, things like that. Um, so sharing uh, that synthesis work we've done and results of particular evaluations where they might be pertinent to partners that are, are doing uh, similar programs or have similar questions. Um, along with that, I think... Uh, Where would one accept such information? Uh, so at ati-research.org, uh, we have them up as our Emerging Insights series, also on uh, povertyactionlab.org. We have a nice uh, evaluations database where you can filter beyond just our agricultural program uh, through the 800 uh, evaluations that our affiliates have done. Um, but I, I, I would say also beyond just those results in the synthesis, we also have some uh, kind of key questions 
to consider that we think of as the priority questions for technology adoption among smallholders in sub-saharan africa and south asia that might be useful when designing learning agendas or things like that to take into consideration. with with that i have a question like you know so you have a repository where anybody can go and look for resources but there are probably as you were just saying there are too many resources will there be any opportunity that a pbo you know can reach out to you and have a dialogue so that you can help them or asai can help them to pinpoint that okay you can read these or these evaluations and that might answer to your specific question that you have in your mind yeah yes that we're absolutely happy to do that to be kind of to help maybe curate our resources a bit and also talk about matchmaking as well as the other function that's something that's a little more difficult and takes a little more time because mainly because we're i i sometimes i think it's helpful to define our define us as what we're not first so we're not a consultancy um as with a lot of evaluation firms where they're competing for contracts and we'll come in and do evaluation we're a diffuse network of affiliated professors who um generally will only take up first of all they're extremely capacity constrained uh and uh secondly they have their own research agendas and um i think that's a primary strength as well but they generally will only take on a project when there's also um questions that can build on economic theory that 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 is of uh professional interest to them as well um so that can make matchmaking a little hard but that's something we're really interested in and happy to um talk about new projects you might have that you're uh, looking to evaluate and go into our affiliate network and try to figure out who might be interested so back to the line yes so diana has google had another question on the discussion regarding when to do rcps she said one issue that she's found is that it is often difficult to coordinate randomization with program implementers for instance uh program implementers may not wish to randomly assign people or clusters to interventions mm -hmm. they may want to purposefully select or target beneficiaries so how do you handle that um i mean i think there's some places where i we don't do an evaluation with a partner who's not willing to randomize essentially um i mean i think there are other things you can do and um sometimes it takes a bit of convincing we have these matchmaking conferences occasionally where we'll invite partners in and uh try to get them uh in a room with other partners who have done who have wrestled with these questions before and have eventually gone through with an evaluation and found found it to be a valuable experience but um i mean there are a lot of different options it's not necessarily you don't just have to do a simple lottery so you can also do like a phase in design where every like i mentioned where everybody uh gets the treatment eventually you can do a rotation where people are getting different uh portions of the program at different times uh that those you need to be a little more careful about what is your counterfactual and what inferences you're making out of it uh you can do randomization within within the bubble if they're willing i think there there's a menu of options you can give an organization that's not necessarily keen on randomly assigning exact who will get everything and who will get nothing but um i but like overall we we specialize in randomized evaluations and there are there are definitely other ways to do rigorous impact evaluations but so that's what we do um uh, yeah go ahead okay i i have a, again you know you might not know the answer because you work with so many you know research projects and researchers but you're building upon building on you know what diana raised so let's assume that if an a project is targeting very poor households and one of their research interest is to find out whether hygiene behavior can reduce the diarrheal incidence right so it's not everybody live in that community the very poor vulnerable house and you have the researcher has decided that he will be randomizing at the community level mm -hmm. right 
So there have to be communities where the project is not going to you know, provide any services, but not to all, the very poor and vulnerable houses. So typically, who identifies those houses, like which is not within the project scope, but we are selecting them anyway for the research purposes, mm -hmm. but there has to be an identification process. And typically, who does that? Is it the implementing agency? Is it the researcher? Is it a I think it could be either. I think typically that's the implementing agency because they have um, they're much more closely related with um, what their inclusion criteria is, anyways. Um, so I think you do a program like that, you would have to do some kind of needs assessment, anyways, to already identify which communities you're going to work in, and I think it would just be expanding those activities. But generally, that would be the. Um. Can you please speak to a little bit more of the ethics of this and kind of what your process is on your side as far as what kind of approval needs to be gone through for institutional review board or how you balance that with kind of the implementing partners because there are lots of impact evaluations or kind of just final project evaluations that would fall into the category of research and these are projects that have people and ethics involved but you're kind of crossing into another line of Maybe, what, like, what's your stance on it? How do you help? What role do you play in seeking ethical approval, et cetera? So um, for our initiative-funded project, oh, they're, they're, first of all, all, all of our projects are, are uh, associated with our, our affiliates who are PIs and professors at these universities, and they all are under various IRB requirements, particularly for our initiative-funded projects. Um, we. Uh, facilitate the IRB process, but all of them go through it. Um, we're also very committed to research transparency, and for our uh, funded projects, we require data publication after uh, two years, and have been working to um, do grants for open access journals. But I don't know if that answers your question. But I, I'm happy to speak to more just like broadly the ethics of. of randomized evaluation as a methodology, but in terms of like our projects and review board sales. Well, so you say that every one of your projects has a PI who's affiliated with the university. Mm -hmm. Most PIs and universities, like the, each university has an institutional review board that mm -hmm. has to go through kind of human subject approval. And then often in the countries where you're working, there actually often needs to be IRB approval in the country that you're working mm -hmm. in. And then even more like re regional IRBs as well, which can sometimes be time intensive, costly, for an institution or you know, an organization that's never done that before, that might be a huge hurdle. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So kind of like, what kind of support do you have there? Because the PIs have also have really busy schedules. So how do you go about like, OK, here is X organization implementing mm -hmm. this big Title II project. We or we're bit, and honestly, like this goes back to I think you need to like think about this when you're bidding on these projects, right? And it needs to be in your mind as part of what you're going to be doing from the very beginning. Like how, but that needs, means that you need to be a PI is like part of that from the very beginning. And what's your role? Like, is are you the facilitator? So that goes. So I work in our global office. We also have six regional offices as JPAL, um, IPA, uh, Innovations for Property Action, which is like our partner organization. Uh, they have country offices all over as well. Those teams on the ground uh, specialize in the, the country level IRBs. And one of the services we provide as an organization to our affiliates is facilitating those kind of uh, things. So they generally are more familiar with and we do require the IRB approval from uh, uh, some of those nationally accredited states but also our regional offices facilitate that for uh, their projects abroad as well. Which, yeah, I, and those can be very complicated and time, time to clearly. And possibly, expensive. Yeah. Particularly if it is a university, then it's a much, much higher fee mm -hmm. than a private contractor. I think we have another question online. Yeah, so this, um, is a question that one of our top colleagues who could not be here but who works on our M&E team um, 
wanted me to pose to you. And her name is Lori Starr. She works for Tango International. And she had a question about how do you not contaminate, or how do you kind of control for contamination of the control group? If, for example, the participants you're giving the textbooks to are sharing them with their sister who lives in the next village over that happens to be your control group. Um, I, I think that's a matter of design and considering what, like, if, if that example is what's happening, that's something that we needed to be thinking about beforehand. Um, and figuring out where we need, like, the geographic distance that these places need to be from one another to be able to, to prevent that kind of spillover. Um, that being said, uh, once things are on the ground, there are always surprises. So, uh, I mean, you can control for it later. It's a, I, it adds on additional assumptions, but yeah, I don't know. I see, before we started the, the presentation, there was a little discussion about an upcoming visit to uh, the DRC, and I wonder whether it would be okay to talk a little bit about what your role will be there, what's going on at that meeting, and what we could learn from that. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting question, <laughs> because we are, we are all in the exploration mode. Mm -hmm. So we invited Kyle and his team to be uh, with us in that workshop to listen to what is being discussed, because in that inception workshop, one of the key points that we will be discussing, looking at their theories of change, what are the key knowledge gaps, right? So some of the knowledge gaps might have already been identified by the implementer, but we will all together, we like to identify what are the knowledge gaps what we like to, what they like to explore further. Mm -hmm. So we wanted uh, them to understand, first of all, you know, it's, a, it's the beginning of it, we hope, a long journey. Mm -hmm. So it would, be, it would be helpful for them to understand what are the key issues that people discuss. And at the same time, one of, one of their, as we were discussing, that one of their objective is to match make, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if all the questions that are being discussed in that workshop whether some of these questions can be also relevant to some of the PIs or some of the researchers that are affiliated with other, mm -hmm. so that they can then start linking the partner with that researcher that way that there is an opportunity that the partner has a question and whether, and they have research, you know, money and researcher, so whether there is a common interest that they can set up an impact evaluation uh, in that particular part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's something else that's really interesting uh, for us as well as for Find and Implement system because it, it is a lot of what I talked about is just that it takes so much pre-planning to do these and also we have a lot of PIs who are very interested in kind of uh, bigger value chain interventions which um, we tend to have a hard time accessing but with the, the year the, uh, the refine period, it seems like a really nice match for being able to do a lot of this pre-work to have a very rigorous evaluation without the pressure of getting to spend on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more question online. <coughs> Joel wanted to know, should we just conduct randomized evaluations when there is a new or innovative um, intervention? Or should it also be done when programs are scientifically proven to be effective? Um, I, I guess it kind of it depends. I would say hopefully mostly focusing on the former. If something's already proven to work and we have we have reason to believe it would. Uh, work in a new context, then it's probably not the best use of resources to do a randomized evaluation. However, I, I guess to step back a bit, I think a big value of the way that, that we operate is uh, we're trying to build theory around, not, we're trying to not just evaluate, like, does this program work in X region of X country with X population? We're trying to do a, a 
build a body of research that gives us uh, more economic theory about what kinds of things work and what are the, the conditions on the ground that are necessary to think about if it's going to work in a new context. So to say something scientifically proven to work, I, 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 I'm, I would step back and say like we're trying to build theory that will then inform, I'm trying to do this new program. It might be something that's worked in another context. What do I need to think about in the implementation? So if it's like this vaccines example, is the, should look to see, like, are people getting the first course of the vaccine, or is, is the problem they're not completing the full course? Like, like that, it, we want to build theory so we know what questions to ask in a, a process evaluation or in the descriptive work we do before starting a program to, to have a better idea of something that is scientifically proven to work in another place is going to work in a new context or at scale. Great. Well, we've got all the questions online, and there's another one. Yes, please, Andrea. Uh, more of a, um, so we'll be doing a couple more of these um, webinars and meetings. Could you just talk a little bit about what the content will be for those kind of follow-on ones? Yeah, so uh, generally what we think about uh, in terms of the, the way we think about agricultural interventions is by constraints to technology adoption. So it's, it's work on the Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative when we think about the uh, take up and profitable and profitable use of agricultural technologies. And we uh, tend to divide things among different constraints that constraint areas that prevent farmers from taking up potentially profitable technologies. So we're talking uh, about credit constraints or liquidity uh, restraints, um, about agricultural risk and different interventions to address that, uh, talking about inputs and outputs markets and uh, also price information and getting farmers access to broader markets and uh, an information as well, so uh, agronomic trainings, different ICT interventions to get uh, information in the hands of farmers, and talking a bit about the body of uh, what what we think we know from uh, completed evaluations, and also uh, what we consider to be the key uh, outstanding questions for a future evaluation. <clears throat> okay. Well, thanks again, uh, Kyle, for coming down from Boston, especially, and everybody for, for turning out here. I think I'll blame the relatively small turnout here on the poor weather, and, and then why not? Feel like home. I'm blaming <laughs> on the travel ban as well. I think we blame everything on that. Um, and thanks to everybody online. I hope we got all of your questions. This has been recorded, and so the slides and uh, Kyle's presentation and the question and answer period will be available online shortly. Um, and as we were just discussing. There will be future webinars like this. We may or may not have an in-person option, uh, but in any case, certainly the, uh, 